Virtual states. During the summer of 2022, many news outlets and bloggers reported that a court of Belarus declared the virtual state of Vaishnoria to be extremists on social media. This news was mostly presented in a humorous tone, highlighting the absurdity of Belarusian courts banning something that doesn't even exist. However, let's try to ask some serious questions in light of this playful news. Are virtual states like a hobby? What exactly is a virtual state? Could someone benefit from them? Is it a game or a joke? Why do people come up with them? Spoiler alert! Yes, it's possible. And the main spoiler is that there are far more virtual states than you might have even imagined. So, Vishnoria. It was created in 2017 during joint Russian-Belarusian military exercise. Why? During strategic military exercises, a scenario of full-scale war is simulated. According to the West 2017 scenario, a model of potential conflict between the northern and the western sides was developed. The northern side consists of Belarus and Russia, while the western side was an invented coalition of three aggressor states, seize a part of Belarus and establish a state called Vishnoryazia. The military mines placed in the northwest Belarus in the real territories of Grodno, Minsk and Vitebsk regions. The exercises took place, but what the military invented became a major meme in the Belarusian segment of the Internet. Users really liked the idea of the invented state. Vishnoria acquired the attributes of a virtual state. A flag, coats of arms, anthem and electronic consulate where one could apply for citizenship. A parliament called the Soem was elected. They have their own currency called the Thaler and account for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, passports and social media accounts that the court deemed extremist. The court's ruling on the seemingly absurd matter once again sparked interest in the concept of virtual state and micronations. What is a virtual state? Hmm. As the term itself suggests, a virtual state is a fictional, non-existent state. It's often associated with the realm of the Internet. With the widespread availability of the Internet, anyone can come up with and create their own country. Also, a virtual state became more prevalent with the advent of the World Wide Web. They actually have existed long before its emergence. Let's recall our childhood when many of us imagined ourselves as the rulers of imaginary countries that existed solely in our minds. Numerous of mysterious invented states can also be found in literature, such as the Emerald City from the Land of Oz, Lilliput, Moomin Valley or Shangri-La. This can be seen as a prototypes of modern virtual nations. Furthermore, there are countless children and adults who play various simulation games, building cities, countries and empires. Game developers understand human psychology very well. Everyone desires to live in their ideal self-constructed world. Some people find satisfaction in arranging their immediate surrounding, while others seek fulfillment in computer games. The most creative and unconventional thinkers can even create their own state, even if it exists solely in the virtual realm. A virtual state is an entity that proclaims itself as a sovereign political unit with the capacity to be a subject of international law. However, it doesn't aim to fully exercise its sovereignty and therefore does not engage in conflicts with the real states. 
Many virtual states often lay claims to uninhabit or neutral territories. How do mock states differ from real ones? Hmm. There are key criteria that easily allow us to determine whether a state is a genuine or not. Territory with a permanent population, uh, governing bodies, uh, monopoly of the use of force, the right to collect taxes. There are also important additional features, such as national symbols, national currency, a common language and an army, among others. Virtual state, as a rule, only simulates some of those criteria, particularly those that can be easily imitated without having a sovereign territory of their own. For example, they may have governing bodies, national symbols, a currency, passports, awards and distinctions. Unrecognized states may mimic all the criteria of uh, genuine states while actually exercising control over territories that the international community usually considers separatist entities or occupied territories. Virtual states are not all the same. They have their own peculiarities, just like conventional states. Virtual states can be divided loosely into three groups. The first group doesn't have uh, their own territory and does not strive for real and complete sovereignty. They are usually not taken seriously by real states on whose lands they are proclaimed. Belarus' judicial decision regarding the virtual state was unprecedented in this regard. The second group consists of those who claim ownership of certain territories, sometimes with a relative success, as we will see below. Those territories are usually natural lands or private properties of their rulers. The third group comprises humorous or satirical states. Furthermore, the forms of governance in virtual states are also diverse, since the most of them are products of imagination, authority and the projects of individuals. Their organizations tend to have a rather autocratic character and adopt an autocratic form of governance. Many virtual states function based on the model of governments in exile. The legislative structure in those states is similar to that of the real states. Typically, the Declaration of the Independence serves as an initial document, proclaiming a new independent state on a particular territory. Subsequently, a constitution is established outlining the foundation of the political system. Recently, with the development of the cryptocurrency world, a new trend has emerged in a realm of virtual state, the network state, and it involves serious money and investments. Renowned venture capitalist and entrepreneur Balaji Srinivasan is one of the proponents behind the creation of the network state. What is the idea behind it? Forward-thinking individuals raise funds through crowdfunding platforms and use it money to purchase various parcels of land in different countries. In other words, enclaves are created, not necessarily adjacent to one another. Simultaneously, a startup community is formed in the virtual realm, which builds the framework of a state centered around remote work, its own culture and art. And at a certain point, this community demands international recognition as a network state. It's an intriguing forecast for the future. By the way, Aristotle defined a state as an association of persons in a political community who have a common purpose and pursue the best life possible. Virtual states more than anyone else, align with this definition.
the creation and development of the virtual states are primarily beneficial to those who conceived them and maintained an interest to those unique commercial projects. The economy of virtual countries is straightforward. They engage in the production of coins, stamps, other monetary symbols and various souvenirs. Becoming a citizen of a virtual state is often very easy. You need to fill out a relatively simple form on the country's website or through a Telegram chatbot. However, if you want to hold a passport of your new homeland in your hands, you have to spend some more money. It's interesting to know there are cases where third-party individuals who are enterprising in nature earn from the popularity of virtual states. For example, after assessing the popularity of the new state of Vaishnoria in the Belarusian online community, a businessman from Grodno quickly started producing merchandise with a state's logo, including mugs, glasses, t-shirts, sweaters and bags. However, here is the catch. He simply downloaded the recognizable logo from the Vaishnoria website without taking care of copyright issues. It was only after making a considerable profit that he reached out to the logo's creator and entered into an agreement. Today, you can buy a t-shirt and a passport cover for 11 euros, a set of three brasses coins for 13 euros, and a magnet for 3 euros. Looking at four virtual states as an example, we can see that they can be completely different, but generally pursue the same goals, serving as a commercial projects. Sealand. The Principality of Sealand is located on the sea platform in the North Sea, 10 kilometers from the coast of Britain. It claims sovereignty over the platform itself and surrounding territorial waters. The Declaration of Independence took place in 1967. The platform was originally constructed by the British Royal Navy during World War II, housing anti-aircraft guns and a garrison of 200 personnel. After the war, the platform was abandoned. In 1967, retired Major Paddy Roy Bates seized the platform and declared the establishment of the sovereign state, proclaiming himself Prince Roy I. Initially, Bates and his associate planned to open an amusement park on the abandoned platform, but they fell out and Bates becomes the sole owner. British authorities made a several unsuccessful attempts to occupy the platform. Petrol boats were repelled by warring shots, and the authorities chose not to escalate the conflict, not taking sea land seriously. During the heyday of the Principality in the mid-1970s, around 50 people lived on the platform, including the Roy First family, their friends and support staff. In 1978, a group of German and Dutch mercenaries attacked the platform. Bates and his family successfully defended against the attack and even took the Asenilis as prisoners. Subsequently, the German ambassador, along with the British diplomats, arrived by helicopter to negotiate to release for the citizens. According to the prince, the negotiations de facto legitimized the country. However, in reality, Sealand is not recognized by any state. After his father's abdication and death, Michael Roy Bates assumed leadership of the state. In reality, Bates' family has long abandoned the country and resides in the United Kingdom. Living on a sea platform with constant winds and turbulent waves is quite challenging. Therefore, the entire activity of the virtual state has shifted to the Internet. By the way, on the Sealand website, one can purchase souvenirs as well as uh, noble titles. 
Becoming a lord or a baron costs as little as 37 euros, while a ducal title is the most expensive, priced almost 600 euros. Sources of income include the sale of postage stamps, coins, souvenirs, titles, and donations. Kugelmugel the name of Kugelmugel comes from the German word Kugel, meaning ball, and Austrian dialect word Mugel, meaning bump or hillock. It is located in the Parter Park in Vienna, the capital of Austria. Kugelmugel claims ownership of the spherical building that serves as its own state and the plot of land on which it is situated. Declaration of Independence, 1976 founded by Edwin Liebberger, an Austrian artist. Liebberger constructed a spherical studio with a diameter of 7 and 7 meters in the federal state of Vollerberg. This led to a legal dispute because the building regulation of Lower Austria prohibited the construction of the spherical residential houses. In protest against what he perceived as absurd rules, Liebberger declared that Kugelmugel was his own city and appointed himself as its mayor. The conflict escalated and due to his ongoing dispute with the authorities, the artist transformed Kugelmugel into a federative state and declared its republic. As a result, Liebberger was accused of tax evasions and unauthorized installation of street signs, leading to his imprisonment. After 10 weeks, he was pardoned by the federal chancellor, but the story became a sensation and Kugelmugel gained fame, attracting crowds of tourists. The spherical state was eventually relocated to the Prater Amusement Park in Vienna. Edwin Liebberger passed away in 2015, but his son, Nikolaus, continues his legacy. Today, Kugelmugel serves as a venue for various art exhibitions, performances and events. It's a unique tourist attraction and is the Austrian capital visited by numerous tourists. Kugelmugel is one of the most accessible virtual state, as particularly all visitors to Vienna have been to the Prater and have a photo of Kugelmugel as a keepsake. Sources of income include the sale of souvenirs, entrance fees and the organization of culture events. The Great Duchy of West Antarctica is located in West Antarctica, on the land of Maribat. It claims 620 square kilometers of Antarctica, mainly as a neutral territory that no country claims. It also asserts claims to two uninhabited islands that Norway and New Zealand consider their territory. Declaration of Independence, 2001 founded by Travis McHenry, a former U.S. Navy sailor Travis McHenry, presumably an adventurous marine, discovered that Marybird Land was the only terra nullius unclaimed land on the continent, meaning that no country had territorial claims over it. The United States wanted to claim it, but they didn't manage to do so there before the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1956, which froze territorial claims. How did Travis do it? Hmm. In his opinion, the treaty contained a loophole. There was no prohibition on individual claims. McHenry sent letters to the government of the parliament, members of the UN Security Council, proposing the creation of a new virtual state. He also sent letters to the governments of countries that had claims on the territories surrounding the new virtual state – Chile, New Zealand, Norway, Austria and Argentina. Naturally, the letters went unanswered. The state has its own bank, and its anthem is set to the tune of God Save the Queen. West Antarctica went through a period of instability when McHenry abdicated the throne and then reclaimed it. West Antarctica became the first and the most active virtual state in Antarctica, and later more than 10 other virtual countries emerged. 
Among them are such names as the Republic of Mariah, the Grand Duchy of Flandrensis, the Kingdom of Finismand, and the Federated States of Antarctica. They all exist on the internet, often forming alliances and quarreling, asserting territorial claims against each other. All of this may seem funny, but those virtual states have hundreds and thousands of real fans and followers who follow their history and development, actively participating in it, donate by passports and souvenirs, thereby developing their economies. Who needs this besides a small group of fans of a particular virtual state? Hmm. For example, in the category of money of private organization of the 1960s, at the World Money Fair, West Arctica coin took first place in 2007. This means that it is a profitable business and a source of income since the coins are in demand among collectors worldwide. Travis McHenry also became one of the founders of MicroCon, a gathering of representatives of micro nations from around the world. Microcon in 2022 took place in August in Las Vegas, with over 100 people from 30 virtual states attending. Freetown Christiania is located in Copenhagen, Denmark, in the district of Christianhaven. It claims as several blocks of Copenhagen that were formed by abandoned barracks as well as two small peninsulas that represent the remnants of defensive ramparts. The Declaration of Independence took place in 1971, and it was founded by anarchists and hippies. The ideological inspire of Christiania was Jacob Ludwigson, a journalist, publisher and well-known European anarchist. In the late 1960s, the military barracks in Christian Heaven were abandoned and fenced off. They quickly became an attractive target for informal use of various movements, who repeatedly attempted to tear down the fence and occupy the vacant buildings. After several clashes with the police, a large group of hippies seized the barracks in 1971. Jacob Ludwigsen proclaimed the creation of the independence free city of Christiania. The police made several attempts to evict the squatters, but without success. Christiania's territory was large enough and there were too many non conformists. The issue of the commune reached the governmental level, and after a year, Christiania was granted the status of a social experiment. Several self governing communities were established in the free city through direct democratic methods. The urban infrastructure began to develop public baths, a children's home, a production facilities and a medical center were opened in Christiania. The Christianities even attempted to participate in the country's political life by taking part in the municipal election of 1974 and gaining several mandates. By the way, Tim Schmidt, a Christianian representative, breastfed her baby during a municipal council meeting shocking the society of the time. Let's not forget that it was the conservative mid-70s. However, the following decades were marked by a permanent conflict between Christiania and the official authorities. Depending on the government in power, the pressure of the free city would either increase to the point of attempting its liquidation or transition to peaceful cooperation. Since Christiania was not under the control of the Danish police, this territory quickly became the main hub of drug trade. The residents themselves made several attempts to put an end to the drug trade, but it always went underground. They had to follow the old and wise principle of if you can beat them, 
Join them! The trade of soft drugs came under the control of the community, and a yellow line was drawn on Pusher Street, the main street of the city, within which drug sales were allowed. The situation changed several times, but with a gradual tolerance of democratic society towards the issue of soft drugs, it has resolved itself today. Christiania remains the main and legal place for selling marijuana in Denmark, even though drugs are formally prohibited in the country. Christiania covers an area of several dozen hectares with a permanent population of about 1,000 people. The enclave is quite isolated from the rest of the city, with only two entrances. One of them bears the sign Attention, you are leaving the European Union. The supreme authority is exercised by the assembly of all the city's residents, which meets at least once a week. Besides, the barracks converted into residential buildings. Many of Christianians' residents build their own homes, usually using recycling materials. As a result, the architecture of the free city is quite diverse. There are conceptual houses that have become landmarks, such as the famous banana, as well as the simple shocks made of plywood and luxurious villas. Sources of income include tourism, as Christiania is one of the most popular places in Denmark. Numerous cafés on the territory pay taxes, income from the sale of marijuana, rent and organizing various culture events, exhibitions, festivals and many, many others, for example, football contest. Christiania has effectively controlled territory, which is why many consider it is not just a virtual state. However, since the Christiania did not seek international recognition or complete separation from Denmark, it exhibits all the characteristics of a virtual state. Over time, Christiania has become a supranational project, particularly functioning as a commune country. In addition, there are several interesting virtual states in one sentence. Seboga is a village in northern Italy that, due to its legal loophole, has never been a part of Italy, allowing a local florist to declare himself to the prince of the Seboga in 1963 and establish a virtual state. Landi is an island in the Bristol Channel, whose owner proclaimed himself its king in 1924 and started minting his own currency. The Kingdom of Gay and Lesbian is a former virtual state located on the island of the Coral Sea off the coast of Australia, as the name suggests. Asgardia is a virtual state in space, established since 2016 with the goal of ensuring the survival of humanity on Earth and creating conditions for the birth of the first child in space. Ericon Empire is a virtual state founded by Canadian child Eric Lees. It has been maintained for several decades and claims various terrestrial and interplanetary territories. In conclusion, a few observations. Virtual state is not just a joke, but it's a serious business that can generate a significant profits for their beneficiaries when properly promoted. The world of a virtual state is limited only by the imagination of the founders. Fictional countries can be located anywhere, even in space. The laws of business apply an original idea. A charismatic leader and effective PR are essential components of any successful project. Anyone can become the owner of their own state. All it takes is consistent work in developing the country, just like any other endeavor one engages in.